Zechariah is a prophet of the Lord, but it's interesting, we don't have much about him other than what the book of Ezra shares with us. But one of the things that uh, Zechariah has been noted for by Bible teachers and those that study the scriptures is that Zechariah's prophecies were to encourage God's people to come back. So they titled him kind of the comeback prophet. And his messages really deal with coming back. The people of Israel were in a period of time of captivity for some 70 years. And when they come out of that captivity and they're coming back into the promised land, it, that's when Zechariah begins to prophesy. He was a, a, a contemporary to Haggai. And we see that Haggai kind of paved the way for the, for the rebuilding of the temple. And then Zechariah comes and encourages the people as they're coming back into the land. So it's not just because they're coming back into the land, but then we see in the latter parts of the book of the prophet Zechariah that he also speaks concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, when Jesus will come back. So you kind of see the twofold message there with the comeback, the people coming back into the land out of the captivity and Jesus Christ coming back at his second coming. The application that I want to be able to kind of take from this, guys, I hope that it would be encouraging to you. As I was praying and seeking the Lord as to always what the need of the church is. We know it's the word of God. We know that Bible teaching is important. But there are a lot of things that I see today, not only because I look and I critique the church, but I first examine my own life. There are things that the Lord constantly makes me aware of that I should be doing and things that I shouldn't be doing. And things that I should be doing, the Lord will point and highlight these things in my life. And, and that's God giving me opportunity to take those steps of faith and come back to the simplicity of what he's called me to. You see, sometimes, guys, we get so busy and all of us know what busyness is. We all know what distraction is. And we all know that we live in a life that is completely busy. There's, there, there's, all of us are doing something on a daily basis along with trying to live a life that pleases God. But so many times, no matter how well versed you are, no matter how much of the word of God you know, or how prayed up or studied up you are, life has a way of just working us over. And we often have to hear encouraging messages. Sometimes we've, we've failed miserably. And we feel like, how do I come back to that place? You see, it's no different than what Zechariah is speaking to the people in his day. I can relate to this book in so many ways in the context of the people coming back out of the captivity. So many things as a young man have taken my heart captive. And it hasn't always been the word of God and living a holy life. And sometimes the Lord then gets our attention like he's gotten mine many times and says... David, you need to come back. What are the very things that the Lord perhaps is placing upon your heart for you to come back? I want you guys throughout our entire time in the book of the prophet Zechariah to just listen to what the Lord is saying, not only to the people of Israel in Zechariah's day, but to the church today. That you want to know what? The church needs to come back to holiness the church needs to come back to prayer and commitment and devotion to God. You know what's interesting, guys, as we'll see as we move on here? Oftentimes, as you look at the very start of this chapter, it's just mind-blowing to me that Zechariah calls the people of God to repent. See, oftentimes we look within the context of repentance and think of sinners, but did you know that there is more spoken of about repentance in regards to God's people than the people who don't believe? It's just a great reminder for us to understand that what repentance does for us is it brings us to a place where we separate ourselves from sin because we turn away from it or whatever it might be. But the other side of it is that we are drawing closer to the Lord. And that's really what the call is here. I mean, consider for a moment just 
the backdrop. Zechariah is the prophet of the comeback, okay? And here's why. Number one, jot it down, Israel had been on a long losing streak. Israel had been on a long losing streak. We know the history. We've studied it very much in the church here with the history of God's people. And Zechariah is prophesying at the end of one of the times in which God had to judge his people. And it was over a period of 70 years. And so we could see that up until that point, at least for the last 70 years. And take note that Zechariah was born in the captivity. But we see that Israel's history as a whole had been on a losing streak. And it's evident by the two very powerful kingdoms and, and, and a nation, Gentile nations, that took the people of Israel captive with Assyria and Babylon. Second reason that we see here is that Israel was a divided kingdom. You see, the reason why God divided the kingdom, remember when Solomon had died and, and, and the kingdoms were divided prior to that, it was always Israel. It's something interesting the Lord said when Rehoboam and Jeroboam were trying to recapture all the tribes, the Lord basically said that this division of the kingdom is my doing. He's actually, well, was actually giving the people of Israel what they wanted. Their king had a divided heart, Solomon, and so the kingdom would be divided after his reign. Now, think with me for a moment here. We know that God adds, or God, you know, God adds and he subtracts, but he doesn't divide. The enemy divides. Man's heart is divisive. And so what did God say? I'll give you what you guys want. You want a divided kingdom? Here it is. You see, and then we see the third point is that Israel had this civil war among themselves. It was an interesting dynamic to see that Israel had lost its focus. Israel then was divided, and Israel found itself in multiple wars time and time again. The fourth thing we see is that Israel had corrupt kings and priests. Corrupt kings and priests. Now remember that the kings were to lead the people, and the priests were to lead the people in worship. Listen, when, when the king is corrupt, then he's leading the people with corrupt means and methods. And then you have the priests. Well, if the king and the priests are corrupt, then that means all their worship and all that they desire to perhaps maybe express in some ways to God were corrupt. I mean, look at this now. The fifth thing we see that Israel was conquered by Assyria. The sixth thing, Judah was conquered by Babylon. And the seventh thing, worst of all, the temple of God destroyed. These seven things, take them down for your notes. These seven things are important to understand. This is the day and age in which Zechariah prophesied. This is, this is what the history of God's people were. So under these bleak conditions, we would say, Zechariah dares to prophesy of a comeback for Israel. How do you come back from this history? How do you come back from years and years of living this way? I think that we find here, if we were just to look at these seven points and see that this is why he's called the prophet of the comeback, some would look at this and they would say, why is it even worth encouraging them to come back? They're done. But Zechariah, the Lord, raises up because he speaks concerning a comeback for the people of Israel. Not only will the temple be rebuilt, but Israel's true king will come to Jerusalem. And listen to this, guys. This king won't ride on a war horse. He'll enter Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, representing peace. But Zechariah also prophesies that this peaceable king Will be the pierced king and coming back in glory as the conquering king of kings. 
So you see, when you look at all of this here, we can say to ourselves, well, this is an amazing thing to see how God worked among his people. And if we can all agree this morning, Israel, they were a pretty difficult group of people. Can I get a witness? But do you kind of see yourself there also? Not too many amens there. But think about this. We can learn how to have a comeback from our captivity or the things that have kept us captive in our faith, in our prayer and devotion to the Lord. You see, church, we need a comeback, a comeback to total surrender and revival in our own lives. And I think that as we look and we take into account Zechariah's word, mission and ministry, then we can begin to consider how God requires us to take these steps to coming back. I mean, really think about this. I was thinking this morning as I was considering all of this and just just in my own personal life, looking at some things that I can say, you know, Lord, I know for sure these are areas that, man, I, I just I just wish I was doing this again. And in no way am I saying, hey, you know what, guys, listen, I'm, I'm not the man I used to be for the Lord. No, God is faithful. And his word endures. But there are areas in my life where I can be honest and sincere and say that sometimes because these areas have lain dormant because of captivity, that I want to look to the word and I want to say, Lord, I want to come back to that place. How often has that been the prayer for many of us in our own lives? Lord, I want to I want to come back to being more loving. Anybody ever prayed that? Lord, I want to come back to being more committed. Anybody ever prayed that? Lord, I, I want to come. I guess the best example we can all use here, because this is a real example and everybody in here has experienced it. If they've truly walked with the Lord and had an experience with Christ when they came to faith. And that is, what we were the day we got saved, we are no longer that today. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to the Lord? Was anybody able to discourage you? Yes or no? No. You were so blown away because you realized the depravity of your own soul in life and, and, and a loving, gracious, sovereign God received you, forgave you, cleansed you and washed you of your sin. And you felt different. You probably didn't look different at first sight, but you knew something was different, right? And, and the love and the devotion and the commitment to your walk with the Lord was so rich, so strong, because it was fresh and it was new. But, but listen, it can always be this way. Yes, there are many warnings in the scriptures as to, you know, coming back and be prepared for trials that take place. Yes, all these warnings in no way are the okay, if you will, verses for why you're not where you used to be. They're just warnings that though the excitement and the joy and this, you know, thing that you're filling with this newfound faith, though that's there, be prepared because that should be the very attitude that carries you through the trials and the adversities that you'll face. But then there's the reality of, of our humanity, right? We are human. And then it seems that for this period of time, we begin to lose some battles. Anybody here ever lost battles? And it's interesting because when we lose these battles, we find ourselves as wounded soldiers. There's a lot of casualties in this war that we call spiritual warfare. And I've seen many that are not just casualties of war, but those that have completely been taken out because of the war. And oftentimes I hear this very word with people, and I'm talking about people that are in church today and people that are not in church today. And it's interesting, in the course of a conversation, 
This is what they say to me. They say, Pastor David, I just need to get back. I just need to come back. I just need to be in the place where I once was, and I just don't know how to do it. It's an interesting thing because people, for whatever reason, feel that there are, there, there are certain things you got to do. Well, if you just do this. No, all God says is do what you did the first time. What brought you to that place? It's one word. What is it? Repentance. Repentance. The method doesn't change. And so when you look at this here, you'll find that this is exactly what Zechariah begins to direct the people with. So with Israel's history behind him, and here he is a young man who was in no way alive during the time that they came and took the kingdom captive. But he's born in this captivity and being born into it. Well, he's born in the land of Babylon and, and the history of his people as he's being told their history that, well, we were never always here. We at one time had our own place, our own land, our own temple, our own place of worship. Zechariah, perhaps in his mind, trying to grasp what it could be like to live in his own land where the God of Israel, his God, the one true God, would be worshipped openly and freely. And he's beginning to perhaps, maybe in his mind, think of what these days could be like. In the time in which the Lord raises him up, Zechariah has the opportunity to experience what it is to be in the land that God gave his people, but he also has the opportunity to walk those through the comeback. I like that. We need to be walked through the comeback. And I think today, all of us this morning can be honest in our hearts and we can say, yes, I'd like to come back. I'd like to come back to this area or that area in my faith. And I want to present that to you guys in this way. Walking through Zechariah's word to the people of Israel, guys, for a dozen years or more, the task of rebuilding the temple had already been there, but it had been half completed. And Zechariah begins to walk the people through the comeback. He's commissioned by God to encourage the people. Listen to this. In their unfinished responsibilities in their unfinished responsibilities. I believe it was on Sunday night when we were looking at one of the passages in Psalm 119. And we looked at verses 81 through 88. And one of the things that we emphasized was in verse 82 of Psalm 119, the psalmist says, my eyes fail from searching your word. In other words, he's saying, listen, that, that to study was hard on his eyes, that his eyes hurt, that he was constantly looking in the scriptures, constantly searching, constantly seeking. And the point that he's making is he was saying, don't give up searching the scriptures because God's word yields within it treasures to us in proportion he gives to us as we search. And then he says, saying, this is what he does, looking to the word of God. He says so much so that his eyes hurt because that's how much he studied. He says, saying, when will you comfort me? Now, here's what I want to emphasize is the quote. Is the quote that Spurgeon made in regards to a sermon that he preached on the comfort of God. And so the question is, when will you comfort me? Lord, when will you bring me back to that place? When will you comfort me? And I love what Spurgeon states. He states this. When you put away unbelief, comfort comes. When you put away unbelief, when you finish complaining, no amens to that one, huh? Praise God that you guys don't complain. God bless you. When you finish complaining, comfort comes. How about this? When you put away sin, you tolerate. Let me say that again. When you put away sin that you tolerate. 
You guys know that sometimes we tolerate sin. Can I get a witness here this morning? And you guys don't want to come back then, huh? Look at what else he goes on to say. I, I love this idea here that Spurgeon, going on in his sermon, he also says this. When we fulfill the duties, we have neglected. That's pretty powerful to me. When we fulfill the duties, we have neglected. Think about this. He encourages the people in their unfinished responsibilities. Rather than exhorting them to action with strong words of rebuke, Zacharias seeks to encourage them to action by reminding them of the future importance, in his case, of the temple. You see, the temple must be built, for one day the Messiah's glory will inhabit it. Think about this. So he's saying, listen, we need to prepare this because this is what we came back for. So that the temple can be rebuilt because the future says the Messiah is going to come and his glory is going to fill the temple. So he's saying, listen, we have a mission and the mission is that we need to come back so that he can come back. And do you know that that is the mission of the New Testament? That Christ is coming back for a church without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle. The church, the temple of the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit of God dwells and resides today, is the very one that Christ will come back for at his second coming. And so with this, we see that Zechariah encourages the people. He encourages them to action. But listen, guys. Though we want the future blessing because so many people's prayers today, because of perhaps the realities of life, our prayer is Maranatha. Right? What does that mean? Come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We know that that is truth because the scriptures declare it. But future blessings, at least in the context here of Zechariah and the people of Israel in his day, is contingent upon present obedience. Let me say that again, please. Future blessings for the people of Israel here in Zechariah's day is contingent upon present obedience. Do you know that this is what? glorifies God more than anything when his children walk faithfully. And guys, listen, though the storms of life come, it doesn't matter how hard it hits, but that we remain focused, that we come back. Don't look for the future blessing until you're practicing the present obedience. Let me say that again. Don't look for the future. Bless. So many of us want the, the future now, and we want to bypass the present obedience. The present obedience is a process that brings us to receive it and seeing the future blessing. God already has the end of the trial, the end of our spiritual battles, the end of our circumstances and situations. He already has the end result. Did you know that? And you know what the end result is? Just so you know right now, okay, newsflash, okay? You might say, I'm going through this pasture and I don't, the end is not in sight. Don't worry about it. It's not supposed to be in sight. You leave that sight in God's hands because we walk by faith and not by. How could it be a battle if you already know what the outcome's going to be? Somebody says, well, you know, and this is the truth. Why doesn't God give us... The picture, well, we know that ultimately if God is in control, we win. We just don't like what we have to go through to win, right? But this is how we come back. So it's contingent upon present obedience, and the people are not merely building a building. What they're building is the future. What you and I are building today is the church, the body of Christ. This is what Peter says. P Peter says that we are living stones being fitted together for, for God's building. Didn't he say that? 
And all of us have our part in this. And so notice what he's saying here, that, that they're building the future. And this should be their motivation. That just like Zechariah calls the people to enter into the building project, he calls them to enter in with wholehearted zeal. Because the future blessing is their Messiah is coming. There is a need for a comeback in our own lives because Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. And so look at the text now in chapter 1 and verse 1 as we see it goes on to say this. Remember the backdrop. What Zechariah has seen physically with his eyes, but now God has given him spiritual eyes to see and to lead and notice that he starts with the first six verses of chapter 1 with a call. Jot that down, a call. There's nothing like when there is a need in our lives or perhaps a project that we are going to do that all of us in here this morning, we know that one person we can call, right? And you know when you call this person, you know, and your hope is that they would respond to the call so that the mission can be accomplished. Well, here, Zechariah calls the people. This is his call to the people. There's a task at hand. There's a work that needs to be accomplished. Do you guys know that even our own lives are a work that is still in progress? Right? Do you all agree with that today? That we are all still... Who's completed here? I just want to know. Please help me, somebody. But we're all a work in progress, right? To your neighbor and say, you need work. Some of you couldn't wait to say that. Okay, great. <laughs> Get it out of your system now. <laughs> no, but listen, we all need, we're in need of work. But, but let's just consider this now. Look to verse 1 as he goes on to, this is an interesting thing, how he also starts off by his word that is given to him by the Lord. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, Let's stop there for a moment here and consider just a couple of things that I think are pretty interesting to take note of. When you look at this here, you see that the setting is the years after the remnant returns because of the Gentile king who just defeated Babylon. The Medo-Persian king Darius that we see here, Zechariah dates... It's interesting that he dates his prophecy according to the reign of a Gentile monarch. This is interesting because it clearly goes to show the present condition and circumstance of Israel. For him to date this prophecy with the present Gentile monarch clearly indicates what Hosea spoke of in chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5, that at this time there would be no descendant of David that was on the throne. This is a very interesting time. In other words, all that they once had has been done and away with. For 70 years, they were captive. In other words, what Hosea is saying, and what we also see in Luke chapter 21 in verse 24, take note of this please, in Daniel chapter 2, in verses 1 on down, and Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 28, that this we could honestly say, the time of the Gentiles. It's an amazing thing. The time of the Gentiles should not be a surprise. It should also be a reminder of God's faithfulness to his word. Last night, before I laid my head to rest, I took time to listen to a sermon that I had taught a couple of months ago on Sunday nights, and it was Psalm 117. And because of a conversation that I had... It, 
with someone, it drew my attention to this, to this psalm. And as I began to listen to it, it just so happened that the psalm was speaking concerning about God's future plan with salvation and the Gentiles. And I must say that it was a pretty good sermon. <laughs> you know, reminding us that God's word is true. And I know we all say amen to that, and, 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 and we agree with that, but, but listen, do we really believe it? This is what Zechariah wants to do. Now, now, hold on. Before we say, yes, I do agree, I truly do believe it, then if that's the case, you should never complain, and you should never worry. The problem is the church says they believe in God's word, but they don't practice believing God's word. And think about it, what Zechariah is saying, listen, it's not just God's word that has been spoken through us in times past. No, God's word is being fulfilled in your very day. And what this should do, this should further encourage you for present obedience to his word. He, he will later begin to tell them, listen, remember your fathers, where are they now? Because the same word that was spoken to them is spoken to you. You see what he's trying to say here as we go a little bit further? Guess what he's going to say? Generations have passed. The captivity has come and it's gone. And now we're on the comeback. And guess what? The only thing that has changed has been the generations of our people. But God's word remains the same. And it's still as powerful as it was in the day in which he spoke it to our people and gave us his law and the oracles of God and so much so today, over 2,000 years later, it's still true. Do you guys know that Zechariah was a young prophet? Just think with this, stick with me for a moment. Zechariah was a young prophet speaking to an old generation. I believe it was Warren Wiersbe in the introduction of this book of the prophet Zechariah in his commentary where he states that he received a phone call from a young pastor who took over a church. And the young pastor called him to get some advice because the entire congregation were senior citizens. And the young pastor, young in age and young in his ministry, felt that the older people were just not listening. They were falling asleep and they weren't paying attention to him. And the reason why he called Pastor Warren Wearsby was because that happened with his first pastorate. So he felt, I'm not connecting with the people. They're older. I'm young. They're not really listening to me. And I just don't know how to make the connection. Now listen, I love the counsel that Wearsby gave him because it was the counsel that was given to Wearsby years before. You see now the counsel, how it's being passed down from generation to generation. He says, listen, you might be young in age, but when you open up that word, you're over 2,000 years old. The word of the Lord remains forever. It's a sure word. It stands and it has stood the test of time throughout all the ages. And to this day, it speaks very loud and clear, just as it did in Zechariah's day. He dates it with a Gentile monarch saying, listen, do you understand the days that we're living in? They're godless days in the context of there's no true worship of the Lord God. And we can kind of relate that today and where we're living it. The church is more tempted with living a life of worldliness than holiness. They've replaced tolerance with come as you are. Well, aren't they supposed to come as we are? Then we just got to accept them the way they are. Well, no, the idea is there's really nothing you have to do to come to the Lord other than come. It doesn't matter what place you're at in life. That's what that really means. It doesn't mean that you just come to church as you are and you want to know what? Maybe five, ten years down the line, we'll figure it out. But just go ahead and live in your sin while you come to church. Eventually, it'll, your sin will leave you. No. The point is, is that there is a call, and the call is 
to reject the things that separate fellowship with God and to come back to the very thing that draws us closer to God. Think about that for a moment. Reject the things that break fellowship with God and come back to the things that draw us closer to God. So in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, what we see here, the year of Darius, about 538 B.C., when they defeated Babylon, it says the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. The name Zechariah means that Yahweh remembers. And I'm so thankful that the Lord remembers, aren't you? That the God remembers our affliction. He remembers the things that we go through. He sees the very things that you and I experience in our own lives. You see, but here's another thing that the Lord remembers. He remembers his word. And the idea that Yahweh has remembered really is what dominates this entire book. Israel will be blessed because... Yahweh remembers the covenant that he had made with the fathers. In other words, the future blessings will come because God is faithful. Now, it doesn't mean that God remembers his word because he forgets. The point being made is that when it says Yahweh remembers, the idea really is that he will fulfill his word. God doesn't forget, okay? They don't, you know, don't think, why would he name him Zechariah if he's God? And why does God forget? The idea is that God will complete. And so here, Zechariah is directing and leading the people in this way. So his name, Zechariah, means the Lord remembers or Yahweh remembers. This is the prophet of restoration, the comeback kid. The son of Barakai. Now, now the name Barakai means the Lord blesses. Interesting. The Lord blesses. And then he gives us his grandfather's name here, the son of Edo, which means advance or timely. It's interesting as you begin to look at all these names, the Lord remembers, the Lord blesses, and really he does so in a timely manner as he advances his purpose and his will. We are invited to be a part of that. In the book of Ezra, what we find here is that it says the son of Edo, which really is his grandfather's name, but but we know here in the book of the prophet Zechariah his lineage. And he comes from a line of those that have had a relationship with the Lord. And so this is the word as we begin to see here as he begins to lay this out. So what we see here is this common name of Zechariah found over 20 times in the Old Testament. And as I said before, the details of Zechariah that we see before this book are found in Ezra chapter 5 in verses 1 and 2 and Ezra chapter 6 in verse 14, both chapters of the book of Ezra. So what is he to do? We said this earlier, he is called to encourage and mobilize God's people to complete the task of God's people Because God's people lost momentum in this task. You ever lose momentum in your task? Anybody here? Amen. And then he's also reminding the people of God's love for them, no matter their circumstance. You know that sometimes, guys, when we are in this place where we need to come back in our life, there are people who have truly experienced this weight of a mind trip, and they think that for some reason God doesn't love them anymore. For some reason God has forgotten them, and for some reason God's not hearing their prayer. And yes, though there are perhaps things that can put us in a place and where you know we are no longer in that intimacy and fellowship with the Lord, but just so we know, God never stops loving us. That's a great reminder. That your comeback is not contingent upon you waiting for the day for God to love you again. It doesn't matter how far you stray or what you do, God always loves you. And this is a great reminder for the people that, you know, they come back and they kind of feel like, well, you know, I just feel so awful. This is always for people who have perhaps backslidden. And I know right now when we say that word, we think of people, and you're probably thinking of someone right now that's no longer here. 
But there are many within the body of Christ that come to church on a daily basis that are backslidden already in their hearts. And you know what God's word should do every single service? It should always challenge us to come back. I don't know about you guys, but I need to always be reminded I have yet to meet a true follower of Jesus that doesn't repent every day. I'm reminded of Pastor Chuck when he would say, there's not a day that he does not wake up or go to bed where he does not ask the Lord to forgive him of his sins. It's not about being saved all over again. It's about walking in complete repentance before the Lord because you want to know what? There's nothing within ourselves that we could do that makes us right with God. The prerequisite for the future blessings is repentance. And so we see here that he begins with encouraging them with this word of the Lord that comes. So uh, after 70 years of captivity... There was no king over Israel or Judah at this time. The people were in need of direction. And the Bible says in verse 2, this is the present condition. Jot it down in your notes. Just put present. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Now, you know, when you look at this, you got to hear how you've come to this place, right? Have you ever kind of just took some steps back in your walk with the Lord and then you really feel the the estrangement from the Lord, and you start to say, it just doesn't feel the same. Anybody know what I'm talking about today, or am I just being weird here? Okay, good. Like, it's just like, it, the, the reading does, it's not the same. Prayer's not the same. Fellowship's not. You know that the issue is not the word and the people. The issue is your own heart. You know that, right? But the enemy just does a work on us sometimes, right? And you feel like you, it's like, I, I just can't, Lord, help me. And then you begin to ask yourself, when did this start? Anybody ever been there? I know I do this. Maybe I'm just, maybe this is just for me, okay? Let me invite you in to listen to how I talk to myself in my mind, okay? I'm going to help you guys this morning a little bit. But listen, I ask myself, Lord, where did this start? And this is kind of what Zechariah is doing with the people. Listen, he's saying, do you understand the day that we're in? The reality is here's a prophet of the Lord, and he's marking the start of his mission and ministry by dating during the time and ruling and reign of a Gentile monarch. You know what realization comes to the people right now? That there is no king in the land of Israel, but yet God is still speaking to his people. Oh, some of you ain't hearing that. He's saying, listen, no matter the circumstance or situation in your life that is taking place, God loves you and desires to speak to you, but you need to hear the the bad and the ugly before you get to the good. Verse 2 says, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Now, don't look at this and say, oh, here we go now. I'm going to be judged and condemned. Now, sometimes it's important for us to understand where we have fallen away. You know, guys, I want to know where I blew it so I don't blow it again. How many of you guys like blowing it again? <laughs> Some of you are ready to raise your hand. <laughs> oh, boy, I tell you, you're so used to raising it. <laughs> I like to get you with one of those good ones every now and then. <laughs> but, but you see, we don't want to repeat the same thing. So this is what he's highlighting. This is the present condition. Now, 2 Kings chapter 21. Just jot this down in your notes. 2 Kings chapter 21. I'll read it to you. This was what brought them to this very place. Okay, guys? 2 Kings chapter 21. And then look at what it goes on to say here, starting in verse 14. So I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance... And deliver them into the hand of their enemies. This is God speaking about the people of Israel. And he says, and they shall come, become victims of plunder to all their enemies. Because they have done evil in my sight. And have provoked me to anger since the day of their fathers. As they came out of Egypt, even to this very day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Besides his sin, by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. 
Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Manasseh rested with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his own house, in the garden of Uzzah, the son of Ammon, reigned in his place. Notice these words. Prior to their captivity, this is what Zechariah is saying. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Well, that's, there it is. This is what brought them to this very place. You see, their fathers doomed the nation to exile. And what Zechariah is saying, listen, we have to go back, not because God is throwing what brought you to this place in your face. The Lord is saying, here's the reality of it. Beware, lest you do the same. I don't like being reminded of what brought me to the place, but the Lord is saying, I got to show you, you got to see, because I want you to understand that really this is my working in you. It's needful for you. You don't like nobody reminding you of your shortcomings and your failures, right? But boy, we love to remind others about theirs. Oh, I'm, I'm inviting you again in. Okay, yeah, there we go. Good, good. Let's get back on track, okay? But, but listen, we're so quick to go and, well, you know, you, hold on here. This in no way is what Zachariah is doing. Is he's saying, listen, this reminder of our past is preparing our heart for our future. Let me say that again. This reminder of our past is preparing our heart for our future. Church, listen, this morning, if I can stress this enough, we at times have to be reminded of the shortcomings that have led us to a place where we realize today, perhaps maybe one of us, maybe only me or some of us, saying, I need to come back. That spark is not there. Well, is it because God's lost his power? No. Is it because the word of God is not true? Is it really because of anybody else in your life? You can't blame nobody for your spiritual weakness. It's you and the Lord. Oh boy, I'll tell you. Some people think that when we stand before the Lord, they're going to be able to say, well, you know, just so-and-so, you know, you know, God, how they are. <laughs> you know, you're not going to be able to do that because, you know, we believe that our lives will flash before us. So you won't have to answer. You're going to see why you did what you did. And the reality of it is sometimes we don't even realize that it was us. This is what Zechariah is saying. Do you understand? You see, in order for God to take you forward, you need to understand some things about yourself. Nobody wants to understand things about themselves. So once again, let me invite you so you can understand some things about me. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. This is the same thing that Paul the Apostle speaks to the church in 1 Corinthians. Remember as he reminds them in chapter 10, beware of these things, because these things were given to us as examples so that we can learn. This is what it says very clearly here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul has the same idea in mind. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. They were written for our instruction. Did you know that verses 1 through 10 are examples of the Old Testament? He's saying, listen, these things they did. They were idolaters. Boy, they messed up. But he goes on to say, these are here for our example. They tempted God. They resisted him. They rejected him. And, and Paul is encouraging the church here this believers, he's saying, listen, we can make the very same mistake. Why are we studying the history of God's people today in 2018 when this here obviously took place in the year of about 520 B.C.? Why? Because human nature has been the same since the very beginning of its existence, and that is fallen. And the only one that redeems that fallen nature is God. 
So we have to understand that within us, no matter how much of the Word of God we know, and no matter how many Bible studies and services we attend, all of us here can attest, like the people of Israel in their day, and say, boy, we just need to live in present obedience to His Word. Maybe none of us are living in present disobedience. But I think that I personally can use present obedience in my life, in my thoughts. The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them. Okay, it's like the first thing. It's like, wow, okay, that doesn't feel good, right? You know, when you go and you tell someone, you know, go talk to them, but, but don't, don't mention anything they did. Just encourage them. You know, you're probably doing more damage you should be truthful and express to them, this is what led up to it, but, but here's the hope that we have now. Look at what he goes on to say. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, listen to this, guys, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. You remember in the New Testament it says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. It was Tozer who gave this idea on drawing close to God. Tozer's statement is nearness to the Lord is likeness with the Lord. Nearness is likeness. To be near to God is to be like Him. That the characteristics... You want to be close to Jesus, then you need to live your life the way Jesus lived his life. There's no way a person can say, yeah, you know what, I'm close to God. But boy, I'll tell you, their life shows they're closer to the devil than they are to God. Does it make sense? This, isn't that the common complaint of the person that views the life of the Christian? And what do they say, man, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want nothing to do with it. I've heard that statement before. And that kind of falls in line here because God's people, when they, when, they, when they separated from the Lord, they failed in their mission to be a light to the Gentiles. To be a light to the world around them. Nearness to God clearly is God inviting and he's saying, listen, draw near to me. This is the Lord saying, come. Come. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Guys, listen. What we see here is a threefold repetition here, just in this verse alone, of the divine name. It's emphasized. The divine imperative to this call of repentance. Notice, it says, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Emphasis added. Unless our hearts are right with God, we cannot hear his word with true spiritual comprehension. I want to understand God's word. Then if there is an issue with understanding the word of God, understand the point being made here is that this is a command with promise. If you return to the Lord, he will return to you. And, and really think about it. There needs to be a desire. I believe the people of Israel in Zechariah's day have a desire. Zechariah will lead the people in some amazing things, but the reality has to be said. If we are far from the Lord today, whose fault is it? This is really what Zechariah is pointing out here. Now, that doesn't mean we cannot be close to the Lord. He's saying, listen, God desires us to be close to him. And he's providing a way by which we can draw closer. And guys, listen, in no way do we see, even though the Lord reveals to them their present condition, guys, and he re re encourages them a call for, for repentance, returning to the Lord, what we see with the reality of their present condition, the Lord once again extends divine grace. I'm jacked up, Lord. That's okay, come. I messed up, God. I know, but that's okay. Come. God, it just doesn't feel the same. I feel so far from you. That's okay. Come. 
If you come to me, I will return to you. Do you understand? that You only get out of Christianity what you put into it. You want to be closer to God? And some people think that it, that comes by, oh, man, if Pastor Dave does an altar call, yeah, okay, you know, you know it's 9, 930 right now. You know, hopefully he ends with one of those because if he just prays for me, I can come back. No, listen, the Lord is saying right here three times he says, come. Come. I know what you did. But come. We often worry about what man thinks of us. Do you hear what the Lord is saying of you? Think about what he says. Unless our hearts are right with God, we cannot hear his word with true spiritual comprehension. He reminds him, he says three times, return, return, return to me. Come, says the Lord of hosts, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Remember what it says in the book of Hebrews, harden not your heart. We can harden our hearts. Their fathers hardened their hearts. The Lord is saying, don't harden your heart. Some, you know what forms of hardening the heart are? You guys probably think, well, I'm not hardening my heart. I'm receiving the word. No, when you think you don't need help. Is there anybody here today you can be honest in your heart and you can say you just don't really need help from the Lord today? Anybody here? Raise your hand because I, I want to kick it with you a little bit. How many can be honest and say, there's no doubt in my mind that today I'm here. I need God's help. You see, this is what it's about. It has nothing to do with you raise your hand. It's like, I don't want to raise my hand. I want them to know how spiritual I am. You see, unless our hearts are right with God, we cannot hear his word with true spiritual comprehension. I want to hear. And so what he does is he gives a warning here against disobedience. Harden not your heart. Turn from your evil ways and your evil deeds He's not saying this in a sense. He's just reminded him. He's saying, listen, this is the very thing that has got, gone on in the, in the lives and in the hearts of your father. It's one thing to ask God to bless you, but another to be the kind of people that he can bless. We often say, God, bless me, bless me, Lord, bless me. Help me, God, bless us, bless us. But we're not the type of people that can because we are what? Not where we should be. You know, sometimes God blesses us and we take the very blessings that God has given us and we turn them into our own curse. Well, what's, what's the common one? God, I need a car. Bless me with a car. Then God blesses you with a bucket, man. Right? And you're dipping like crazy in that thing. And before you know it, you ain't showing up to church. You ain't giving nobody a ride to church. You know what I'm saying? Because when you don't got a car and you're looking for a ride and you're praying and you're like, oh, Lord, and then somebody gives you a ride. God bless you. You know, you're 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 happy like, man, I want to do this for someone. When, Lord, you bless me with a car, then God blesses you. with You ain't picking nobody. I, mean, like, I don't know if I got you got gas money. Because, <laughs> you know, gas prices, the oil, you know, they start bringing up the Middle East and all that stuff. And no, I'm just kidding. Anyways, you know, it's like you you you, you forget. When you cried out to the Lord. And God met your need right then and there. It's as easy as that. I use this as an example because I've seen it a lot. And you're like, God bless me with this. How? If you're not here no more. Yeah, about that. Here's the good one. God blessed me with a job and you never see them again. And you see them years later and they're hiding from you in the grocery store or something. I don't know where. <laughs> You could see them looking at you. They're kind of like, oh, there he is. I've seen people. I've seen them go, the pastor right there. <laughs> so the first thing I ask them, where you been? How's that new job? And it's like they don't want to say nothing bad about it. It's great. I got a better position. I got a raise. I, I work more hours. I got a lot of overtime. And I let them talk through. And I've been able to get my own place. And I've been able to get another car. And, and I've been there, there, this, this, and that. And I says, wow. So what about your walk with the Lord? Because that's what really matters. 
I've done it. They say, wow, you know, I'm just, I'm just really busy. I remember one man, I looked him in the face. And I said, brother, if you're too busy with the blessing that God gave you, and now that you have money, you don't need God, may your money perish with you. You need the Lord. Because your money's not going to get you into heaven, bro. Period. Don't live for this life. Live for the life to come in this present life. That's how we do it. People say, you're crazy. You're living like you're rich. You only got 20 bucks to your name. You don't know the God I serve. I might have 20 bucks, but boy, I feel like a billionaire right now. You want to go to McDonald's? Dollar menu, I'll hook you up. <laughs> Some people just don't get it. If we want to be close to God, we must be obedient and develop godly character. I want to develop godly character. Guys, can I be honest with you today? I want to be more godly. Anybody here with me? Okay, good. Praise God. Verse 5, he says, here's the delay. They delayed. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? In other words, they've died. Your, your fathers had opportunity, and opportunity has passed them by. Don't repeat the mistake your fathers made. Your fathers failed by taking the opportunity. But here's the hope that we have. The prophets might be dead, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Yet surely my word, verse 6 Surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servant, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? You know what he's saying here? The word of the Lord lives on. God's word accomplishes all that he designs. Isn't that what Isaiah 55 in verses 10 and 11 say? In blessings and in judgments, God's word fulfills everything. Guys, listen, you are rich because of the word of God. So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to us to do according to your ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Do you see what he's saying here? This is pretty amazing. Let me, we're going to close with this. In other words... When it says, so they returned, here he spoke the word. What are they saying? They understood God's hand in judgment. They understood how they got to this place, and they understood that it was God the entire time that was working in and through their lives. They had the right perspective. They admitted that their punishment was deserved and that God was just. Quotation here from Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 17. It seems that in his call to repentance, he was preparing the people for the message that he was about to repeat or share with them that the Lord had given him. And guys, listen, do you understand what Zechariah is doing? He's doing in these first six verses what Jesus and John the Apostle did. What was Jesus' last words? Some people say the Great Commission. Those weren't Jesus' last words to the church. His last words to the church are found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, verse 16, verse 21, verse 22, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3, and Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. In all these cases, Jesus said to the church, repent, repent. Because in repentance, we are able to draw closer to 